in our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, today we continue our sermon series in the Gospel of Mark. We're at the end of chapter 15 today, verse 40 through 47. This is a section where we are told about the burial of Jesus, where we see that his body was honored in his death. It's a matter that's actually covered in all four Gospels in some detail because it is something important for us to understand. It's in our creed that, about his death and burial, and we live in a day where there is little understanding about the importance of the physical body, either the body of Christ or of our own bodies. So my prayer is that God will be pleased to rectify some of that confusion among us as we consider what his word says here about the burial of Jesus Christ. Our scripture text begins in verse 40, Mark 15, verse 40 to verse 47. So please listen as I read this to you. It's God's holy and infallible word. Mark 15, 40. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the less, and Joseph and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went in to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen. And he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. And there we end the reading of God's holy word. May he add his blessing to it. I just want to point out to you something, an interesting structural thing that there. We're not, I'm not going to emphasize this, but I just want to point it out here before we get into the text that there is a kind of a sandwich here in Mark like we've seen before. It, you have to go on into chapter 16 to see it. But you see that the women are introduced in verse 40 through 41 as those who are standing far off is how Mark shows them at this time in the, in the situation. And then... He tells about Joseph in the middle of the sandwich, and then it goes back to talk about the women and their fearfulness. And in Mark, when you go all the way from chapter 16, verse 1 to verse 8, you find in verse 8 that the angel told them to go and tell the disciples, and the first thing they did is they went away and didn't speak to anyone because they were so afraid. And we know that later on that um, that some of them actually uh, saw Jesus, um, Mary Magdalene and different ones, and then they began to talk to them, and then they, they went and told the disciples. We get different bits and pieces, but the initial reaction was that they were afraid. So Joseph, you see, stands in contrast here to the women who are, who are fearful and afraid, and Joseph, who comes boldly to take the body of Jesus and care for it. So may God add his blessing as we consider his word today in these matters. I want you to see in this text that Jesus' body was honored at his death. God saw to that. Not only did he bring it about by his sovereign hand, as he brings all things, of course, about by his sovereign hand, that Jesus was buried by a rich man, but he also recorded in prophecy long before it happened that this is what was going to happen, that he would be with the rich in his death. By recording it in prophecy, it has a way of emphasizing it as something that God expressly planned. It draws our attention to it as something that was important and integral 
to God's working, that it's highlighted that way. The prophecy itself is given in Isaiah 53, the chapter that tells us about the sufferings of our Lord Jesus on the cross for our sin. And it stands out, the verse that refers to this, it stands out in contrast to the rest of the prophecy in Isaiah 53, which is all about the dishonor that was heaped upon Jesus at the time. Well, it talks about the, um, the prosperity of his work and the success of it, but it's in the midst of a section telling about all of him being cut off and so on. It says, Isaiah 53, 9, And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. So it's as if saying that even though he died the death of the wicked with the wicked, it says that he was with the rich at his death, and it gives the reason that he was with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence. He hadn't done anything wrong. There was no lie, no deceit found in his mouth. So being in the rich, being with the rich in his death was a mark of God's approval of him. It was a kind of a testimony. This burial was a testimony, an early testimony that he had found favor with God. We just sang in Psalm 16, the psalm that talks about him in the grave and how he was resting in hope and assurance. He wasn't still crying out, oh, where are you? Why have you forsaken me? No, he was, he was comforted. He was resting in peace and in hope, waiting for the, the deliverance that would come. You can see in our reading that Joseph of Arimathea is the rich man who came to bury him. It's very striking and a surprising event. This man that, who would have thought that this guy was going to show up, this, this rich man, and bury Jesus? He's described as a godly man who mustered his courage to come forward publicly like this and to ask for the body of Jesus. Look at verse, from verse 43. Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Now, a prominent man, that would mean that he was what, uh, in former days, you often refer to as a respectable man in our society. A man of influence, a man of wealth in the community. It says, indeed, that he was a council member. And that means that he was a member of the Sanhedrin. One of the 70 men in the highest Jewish court, the court that had condemned Jesus to be crucified. We're told elsewhere of Joseph of Arimathea that he did not consent to that decision. We don't know whether he wasn't there when they uh, passed that sentence or whether he didn't vote, whether he abstained, whether he said no. We don't know how that went. But in saying that he was waiting for the kingdom of God, it also indicates that he was a man of genuine faith. Because that's how you would describe someone that trusted in the promise of salvation that God had made to his people. And they were looking and waiting for the kingdom to come, like Simeon and Anna that we meet early on in, uh, when, when Jesus is first born. It says that he took courage because by coming forth like this to honor the body of Jesus with an honorable burial, he would take on the reproach of Christ. Everybody would see that he was associated to, with him, that he was sympathetic with him. And this is all the more remarkable, it was, it's all the more remarkable for a rich man to do that. Like Calvin says, you know, rich man can't stand to have their, a rich, prominent man in the community. He can't stand to have his, his reputation brought down in the mud like this. This is someone that had just been, been crucified, that, that had been rejected by Israel and his own people, and the Romans had agreed to, to crucify him. And, and this man had so much to lose. He had his position. He had his riches. He was giving everything in, in doing this. As Jesus said, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. How much harder 
when it was in these circumstances that he comes forward. Joseph had been a secret disciple until now. This shows how God can can bring a powerful work into the life of someone to, to turn them around. Someone that had been kind of walking with Christ, kind of accepting Him, kind of believing. But now there's something that completely changes and He's all out for Christ. He boldly comes forth. This passage goes on to explain the burial that He gave to our Lord. Verse 44 and 45, it tells us that Pilate, after finding out from the centurion that Jesus was dead, granted the body to Joseph. That's kind of significant because it's not likely that anyone but a prominent man like Joseph would have been granted that permission. Probably if some of Jesus' relatives or some of the disciples had gone to Pilate and asked for the body, he would have said, eh, you know, I don't don't think so. He he was the man for the time. Not only that, but they wouldn't have had all the resources that they would need to be able to to do this. He was was a rich man. He was was suited to give him this honorable burial. Where where would they put him? You know, they wouldn't have been able to put him in a fine tomb like, like Joseph did. The Romans often let those accused of treason left them to rot on the cross or to be eaten by animals. Now, the Jews didn't didn't like that, and so for their sake, they would sometimes throw them in a common grave, and sometimes they would give them if their relatives asked for it. They would sometimes do that, but the reason that they didn't want to do that is because to give an honorable burial would sort of lessen the the effect of the punishment. They wanted it to be a, a terror to the people that this is what happens to the one who commits treason, but of course, Pilate didn't really think Jesus had done anything. And so he was then maybe more sympathetic in that regard, too. So Joseph obtained this permission. Why did Joseph obtain the permission? It was because it was God's will for Jesus to be honored at this time. Because to show that he he was a man that there was no violence in him or or deceit that was found in his mouth. Verse 46 tells us that of, of the fine burial that Jesus was given. It wasn't a freshly prepared tomb that had been cut out of the rock, that no, no one had been put in this tomb yet. It was, it was a burial that only a rich person could afford, especially in Jerusalem. This would have been a, a, a tomb that very, very few people could, uh, could afford, cut, cutting it out. They, they made uh, shells in the tombs for the bodies, and um, some of them were really large. Uh, we were told of one that was found that had 60 shelves in it for, for bodies, and they wouldn't even leave the bodies there after the, the flesh decayed. Then they would take the bones and put them in a, a place under in the, in the ground in the tomb. Uh, it was what they often did. They would have a kind of a receptacle for all the bones that would be put collectively together. So, so it's sort of an interesting thing to think about. Here's one that no one's ever been put, placed in, and then in verse 46 says, uh, then he, he bought fine linen, took him down and wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. We're told in John that a great amount of expensive spices were also provided. Now we know in John as well that Nicodemus came along here too. And uh, we shouldn't picture, these were rich men, we shouldn't picture them with their fine robes on, pulling the nails out and loosening. They, they had a whole bunch of servants. And so they, you couldn't do, two men could hardly do this. They had, they had help and assistance in carrying the body and probably even something to carry him on. And they had uh, guys running to get the supplies that they needed. You couldn't possibly do this in the, in the just couple of hours that they had to get it done because... They had to get it done before the sun went down because that would be when the Sabbath began and you weren't to be about burying anyone when it was the Sabbath day. So they, the burial, of course, Jesus died around three in the afternoon in our way of reckoning time. And then three hours later at sunset, uh, six o'clock, that uh, when the sun went down, they, they had to get everything done. So again, you had to have resources to be able to do this. Imagine the disciples out trying to dig a a hole in the ground or something, you know, it would have been very, very difficult. So an honorable burial, why? 
Well, it was important for a number of reasons. First, in making it clear that Jesus was indeed dead. One argument that God's enemies never made against the resurrection in the first century was that Jesus did not really die. They never made that argument, that he was just in a swoon. You didn't ever hear that. There's no record of that argument ever being made in the early church. We see Mark's account that there are three groups of witnesses to his death. Joseph and those with him who buried Jesus. Certainly they wouldn't have wrapped him up in the, in the cloth and the spices and laid him in a tomb if he was still alive. The women who watched him die and watched his burial, they are also witnesses. But most significant at all, and of all, and this is the one that no one could really get around in the first century. They, they, later on, people tried to deny it. But that uh, with the Romans, we see how careful Pilate was to make sure that Jesus was dead, and how he checked with the centurion who was in charge of the execution and received assurance that he was already dead. Now, the executioner, this uh, centurion, that was his job, was to uh, execute people. It should be noted that there were hundreds of thousands of executions by crucifixion that the Romans did, and there's not one account of anyone that survived the crucifixion. It's not one account of someone that was only partly dead and then came back to life. Everybody knew that in the first century. And so no one, that's why there's absolutely zero uh, evidence of record of anyone coming forth at that time and saying, oh, well, well, well he, he didn't really die, he was just sleeping. That came centuries later, um, much later in church history. The people at that time would have thought that that was ridiculous. A second reason for the honorable burial was for God the Father to show that he accepted his son's sacrifice. I've already touched on this, that, that there was an approval of what Jesus had done. As we saw last week on the cross, there was that time of darkness when Jesus was estranged from the Father and when he cried out, when he was bearing the curse and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But then we saw that there was a change and that he yielded up his life. And it's like he, there had been a, a, a peace that he sort of came to and, and he, he breathed his life out of him, as it were, because his work was finished. His honorable burial shows that his offering was accepted. I already referred to this in Isaiah 53, 9, that he was with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, nor is any deceit found in his mouth. So we know that he was already accepted. His sacrifice was already accepted when he died. By him, death, still a humiliation, lost its sting. Okay? He didn't go to the grave in terror, but he went to the grave in peace. And death loses its sting. If we're in him, we can go to our grave in peace. Calvin pointed out that the burial of Christ is added as an intermediate transition from the ignominy of the cross to the glory of the resurrection. His burial showed that he truly died indeed, but also that the cursing which he had endured was now over. He was not thrown in a ditch as those that were still cursed, but he was honorably buried. <clears throat> a third reason for his honorable burial is to show that the grave is not the end. In Christ, it has been transformed into a refuge and a shelter for bodies of the saints until the resurrection. Though we are eaten by worms, we will be raised up like Jesus was raised up. It was a necessary part of the work of Jesus that he die because he had to conquer death in the grave for us, as well as to bear the curse. He had to suffer the humiliation of death where he was no longer able, now think about this, he was no longer able to worship God and to serve his neighbor, now careful language here, in the way that God has appointed for human beings to do that. We worship God with our bodies as well as our spirits. The worship that God has appointed for us 
involves our body as well as our spirit. You can't worship God as a human being the way he is appointed by going in a cave and meditating. You worship God in the assembly of his people, bringing praise to his name in the ways that he's appointed, coming to the Lord's table, hearing the word preached. We worship God, bringing our prayers to him. Related to that, the honor shown to Jesus' body emphasizes, the fourth reason for this is it emphasizes how important Christ's physical body is. Honoring it even in death reminds us that he had to come to earth to, and acquire a true human body and spirit to represent us. He did this both to fulfill the righteous obedience that God requires of us as one of us, truly one of us, and to give his body an offering to atone for our sins. He says in Psalm 40, you have prepared a body for me, okay, that that we might receive full pardon and forgiveness by that offering. We need to realize what I mentioned just now, that Jesus could not have obeyed and worshipped God in the way that God created human beings to serve and worship Him without a body. We were created to live on earth, to elaborate on that a little further, to serve one another with our bodies, blessing each other with deeds of service, not just with warm feelings toward each other, um, things we do with our bodies. With our words, we speak to one another. With our material deeds of kindness, we produce beautiful things. We give a cup of cold water to someone. And our worship, again, it's, we, we do acts with our bodies. We, we don't do this in the recess of our heart. Jesus had to have a body to do these things. What did he do when he healed people? He touched them, or people touched him, or he spoke the word. He gave us food to eat when he was here in the body. He calmed storms. He sang praises. He preached. He went to the cross. He rose again in a body. Wherever he went in his body on earth, he brought blessing in that place. You remember the man that came and said, you you don't even have to come and heal. But Jesus spoke the word. The man went to Jesus or sent to Jesus and he spoke and the servant was healed. The father therefore saw to it that his body was honored when he was buried because the body is significant. It's not just a shell. It's something that's integral to all that we are as human beings. And then that brings us finally to see by honoring the body of Jesus with a a burial like this, an important burial, we're reminded that our bodies are also important. It's with our bodies that we bless and that we worship. It's wrong to think that we can do this in our spirits alone. So that brings me to the next main point. Seeing how important the body is, you all need to honor the body. Our society is at war with the body. We must not join our society in that war against the body. At various times in history, there have been those who, have see, who see the body as something that hinders us. They suppose that it's a prison house to the soul and that perfection can only be obtained if we shake off our bodies. In our present times, we see the body as that which hinders our freedom. There are many who mutilate their bodies, cutting them, disfiguring them, tattooing them. Suicide is an ultimate effort to escape the body, to get away from the body. There are many who give themselves to drunkenness or to drugs to alter their brains and the functioning of their brains and their perception. Now, I'm not talking about using medication to restore the body when it's broken. I'm not talking about having a repair of something that's broken or that's ruined by the fall. No, I'm talking about trying to escape the body. That's trying to bring the body to its proper health, but trying to escape and not glorifying God in our bodies. This has gone so far that today people will try to change their God-given gender, hating their body 
and wanting to change it into something that it's not. Or they will try to change God-given sexuality. Men with men or women with women using their bodies in perverting ways that are against nature, against the natural use, what God calls an abomination. It is a desperate attempt to gain control that leaves people in the end in bondage. And we see this, we see this hatred all around us of the body. The right view is that we, including our bodies, were made in the image of God. It is not that God himself has a physical body and that he has arms and legs like we do, but that he made us in such a way that our bodies are used to connect and show love the way God does, who is a pure spirit. We do that as his image bearers with our bodies around other people. When we have come to Christ, our desire should be to use our bodies in the way that God appointed for them to be used. And so you see, rebellion comes when we want to use our body in a way that God didn't appoint for our bodies to be used. We're to use our bodies to serve one another, to provide good things for one another, to make music for each other, to build things for each other, to grow food and serve food to each other, to write books, to make love to our spouse, to worship God with our neighbors. Our rebellion is seen in using our bodies in other ways. That's what sin involves. Why is it that when people rebel against God, there's so often sexual deviation? Because I'm going to use my body in a different way than what God says. A lot of times it's not even a desire for the thing itself. It's a desire to war against God and to go against Him, to turn from Him into ways that I show my independence, that I'm not under God's authority. Or we mutilate our bodies. Or do you think, why would someone mutilate their body? You see, it doesn't even make sense on its own. It's what most sin involves is stuff that we do with our bodies, isn't it? When we reject God, he turns us over to bondage to those things. Like sexual immorality takes us over. Drugs. Even things like recreation or covetousness. People get in bondage to that. You have some miser, he can't even enjoy what he, what he, all his riches. Because he's so focused and just grasping, grasping. When we're saved, we learn to glorify God in our bodies. We need to recognize that our salvation in Christ is not complete until our bodies are perfected, until our bodies are even raised up. Jesus' corpse was honored because it was to be raised again. It was not to be thrown in the trash bin. As mentioned before, it was not thrown in a ditch. It was not burned. His body would be brought back to life again on the third day. In the Bible, we're always told of the burial of the body for God's covenant people. We're even told that God himself buried Moses. And the reason for burial is because we're taught that these self-same bodies will be raised again. It's not that if we're cremated or, or eaten by uh, animals or something that our body can't be raised up anymore. Of course it's not that. But it's a showing of a, a hope in the resurrection and an honor that we care for the body, we honor the body. We don't look at it as something that's just discarded and thrown away. We, uh, uh, there's a proper burial. It doesn't mean it has to be expensive or elaborate if you don't have the means for that sort of thing. But you see the body that's raised up, a lot of people are confused about this. It's not a different body. It's the same body. Jesus' body was the body that was crucified and that laid in a grave, and then the grave was empty. So it is for us. Your body is the body that God gave you. Because of the fall, it has things wrong with it, and those things will all be rectified in the resurrection, just as Jesus rectified them when he was here on the earth, didn't he? He went around and gave sight to the blind, and healed the sick, and cleansed the lepers, every infirmity, every disease. Only at the resurrection, that change will be 
complete and that will be permanent. So our service to God will not be perfected until these bodies are raised up in immortality and glory. It is only then that we will be able to return to the earth with our Lord in a completely renewed earth that Jesus will purge away all those who are his enemies and cast them into the outer darkness. And then we will be able, we will be changed, we will be perfected, and then we will be able to serve God as we were always intended to serve him. And as we were always called to serve him, not apart from our bodies, but in our bodies. That's what we're looking for when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That prayer will be answered. Those who have already departed from this world are absent from the body just now. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, they're absent from the body, but present with the Lord. Yet their desire, he says in that same chapter, we looked at this in uh, our afternoon service not long ago, their, their desire is not to be naked or to be unclothed without a body, but clothed again with their bodies now made perfect. We're to honor our bodies because God is not finished with them. He will bring them to glorious perfection. It matters what we do with our bodies. It matters very much. The Bible always makes that clear. Paul speaks about this in 2 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20. He says in verse 12 and 13 that we should, that we should not be brought under the power of anything like food or drink or sex. Those things should not take possession of us. He says, now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Those we use the body in ways that he wants. He goes on talking about the resurrection in verse 14. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? It's not just our spirit, you see. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. He speaks of how our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. They are to be controlled by the Spirit, not by our sinful passions and lusts and addictions. Many Christians today try to kind of divorce, in their mind at least, kind of divorce the body and the Spirit. Then they suppose that they can serve God with a heart. You know, you'll hear that all the time. Somebody has molested children, murdered people, a bunch of things. And then, you know, the mother will come on and say, but he has a good heart, you know. Well, what we do with our body shows what is in our heart. They suppose that they can do whatever they want with their bodies, that they can abuse them or satisfy their sinful passions and desires. But verse 19 and 20, Paul says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. We are to use our bodies to serve God by serving each other and by worshiping Him. The implication of God seeing that Christ's spiritual body, seeing to it that Christ's spiritual body was honored, is that we ought to honor our bodies then. That's what we were just looking at. But now I want to take up another implication from this passage. We are to imitate Joseph in honoring the physical body of Christ, even when he does not seem to be physically present. Now, I have to do a little bit of explaining about this. To, uh, I hope this isn't too refined, what, I, what I'm saying here. But when I speak of Jesus not seeming to be physically present, I speak of those times that we do not see him doing those things that he would do if he were physically present. You see, when Jesus was physically present in his body, funerals were turned into celebrations of life restored. The dead were raised. When he came upon the blind, the blind were given sight. The lame walked, the deaf heard, lepers were cleansed, the hungry were fed, the sick were healed. But now... It is normal that we must bury our dead and they're not raised up, that we have prevailing sicknesses and agony among us, 
that the blind often do not receive their sight, the deaf often do not hear. There are times when there is also oppression and persecution, when our enemies are strong and when we are weak and we say, where is the Lord? Like if he were here, he could do something. Remember when uh, Lazarus died? If you had been here, then you could have prevented this. When there is drought and famine and destructive storm, when the church is failing and when our enemies are oppressing and there is oppression among the leaders in the land, these are times that we wish Jesus was here. At such times, it can seem as if that Jesus is dead. He seems to be as he was when Joseph took him off the cross, a lifeless corpse. We say, where is the risen Savior now? And indeed, it's true. It is not the same as when he was physically present, nor is it the same as it would be if he were physically present with us now, nor is it the same as it will be when he comes back with his resurrected body, it's already resurrected, when he comes back among us bodily to be with us forevermore. What ought we to do until he comes to live in that fullness of his bodily presence among us? Well, first of all, we ought to recognize that he does live among us bodily in a certain sense, a very important sense. We're told that he is our worship leader, for example. Hebrews 8, 1 and 2 tells us that he is very much alive in body as a minister of the true sanctuary. He says, now this is the main point of the things that we're saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Jesus has a resurrected body and he is seated on the throne in heaven a minister of the sanctuary, it says, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. The ones that were on the earth were the ones we built. Jesus is there in the presence of the Father. Now that phrase, a minister of the sanctuary, the holy place, the place where God's people come to meet God, come before him where he dwells. It's a word that the, the minister of the sanctuary It refers to a liturgist of the holy place, the worship leader. He is bodily in the presence of God, and he is spiritually present with us when we worship. And we should see that as a kind of bodily presence. He's not here in that way that he will be where we can see him, but he's not just a spiritual, but a bodily presence being a human in our flesh. As such, it is our risen Lord who calls us together to worship. Psalm 22, 25, he promised, he made a vow, we sang that earlier, that if God heard him from the cross when he made himself an offering for sin, that he would then, he promised, he vowed, gather his brethren together. He does that all over the world in a bodily way. He gathers us together to declare the gospel to them and to feed them. He says the poor will eat and be satisfied. He is our risen Lord who sings praises with us. In Hebrews 2.12, he says, In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. He is not dead. He is alive and he is with us. When we gather to sing, he who has a body is with us. It it is in a spiritual way, in a sense. But he's not one who is just a spirit. He's one of us. It is our risen Lord who speaks to us when the word is preached. He also said in Hebrews 2.12, I will declare your name to my brethren. And so it is that Paul can write to the Ephesians who had believed who had never met Jesus when he was on the earth, in, a, in, in his body on earth, and he could, say that, uh, he, he could say to those who had believed, he speaks of them as those who have heard him, he says. They've heard Jesus. And of having been 
taught by him. Not of him, but by him. It's Ephesians 4.21. It is he who speaks to those who believe. He said in John 10.27, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And he said there would be a whole lot of sheep that were not of that fold that would hear his voice. How do they hear that? Through the preaching of the word that he appointed, he accompanies that word so that we actually hear him. If our risen Lord who strengthens us, it is our risen Lord who also strengthens us to pray and who prays with us. He says that after he is gone, his disciples' prayers will be even stronger than they were before. John 14, 12, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also and greater works than these he will do because I go to my father and whatever you ask in my name that I will do that the father may be glorified in the son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. It is upon the body of our risen Lord that we also feed when we come to the Lord's table. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? The one with whom we have communion at the table is not dead. He is crucified, but he is very much alive and shares his life and virtue with us when we come to the table. He is very much alive. Still, it is a fact that there are times when his presence seems more like a corpse to us or an absence than a living present Savior. And so it is. It is that that's a fact. When that's so, we need to learn a lesson from Joseph of Arimathea. When did Joseph minister to? to Christ when he was a corpse, when his body was dead. This man stands out among all the rest because he did something that no one else was doing at this time. He ministered to Jesus when his body was limp and lifeless. Everyone else came running to Jesus when he was alive and well, to be healed, to get their problems solved, or whatever it might be. Joseph knew that life would return to this one who had been crucified. Mark shows the women standing far off and watching. And I want to mention here, I mentioned a little bit about this in in the introduction, that the word watch that's used here, I didn't mention this, that that word is not the one where Jesus said, watch and pray, that you enter not into temptation. This is a word that doesn't have such good connotations. This is a word that refers to observing something without it really having the impact that it's supposed to have, without really the faith that ought to be there. In fact, every time, four times previously, this word has been used in Mark, And every single time it's been used of people who observed what Jesus did without any impact, without any faith. They saw, but they were not changed. So you see how in verse 40 it says that they were looking on from afar. That's the word watching that I'm talking about. They were looking on from afar. And Mark uses this word several times here. Then verse 47, that they observed where he was laid. They watched, they saw. Then in in chapter 16, they were wondering how they would move the stone when they go to anoint the body of Jesus themselves. And then they were alarmed when they see the angel who tells them that Jesus is risen and the angel then instructs them to go and tell his disciples. What was their initial response? I mentioned it earlier, verse 8. This is chapter 16. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they, were, they trembled and were amazed, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And these women, as faithless as Mark presents them here, were actually, they actually were outshining the disciples, the twelve at this time. 
they at least are there to observe the death and burial of Jesus. In fact, they have to carry the ball for the 12. They were supposed to be witnesses. And they were not around. We know that John was there, but as a whole, the disciples, they weren't there. They carry the ball for them like Deborah had to do in the time of the judges when Barak was just wimping out. Peter has gone off in shame, denying Christ. The others, except John, have all run away. The faith of the women was weak. The faith of the disciples was even weaker. Why? Well, Jesus is dead. He's a corpse. That's why. What can we do? And then, of course, there were the wicked leaders of Israel who were full of envy and pride, who had delivered Jesus up to be crucified. They were rejoicing that at last they had gotten rid of Jesus. They were like leaders today when they have some success in pushing down the sound of the gospel and pushing down the Lord and the land for a time when they can get it out of sight for a little while, put it out of the way. The mob that had joined the leaders, the wicked leaders, were probably more or less indifferent about it all. They weren't so threatened and envious that way about Jesus. They, it didn't matter much to them that Jesus was gone, like the mob today, if the church is prospering, not prospering, just kind of kind of irrelevant to them. That's the way it is sometimes, isn't it? It's times when it's not prospering. Where are the people of faith? Indeed, it was a hard time. Jesus, who ministered in his body among them, was now a corpse. Even so, Joseph comes forward at that very time. The time when things were at their very lowest, and it seemed like Jesus was finished, he takes the body of Jesus and ministers to it. He cherishes it. He does what he can. My brothers and sisters, God can give you faith at times when it seems like everything is dead in the church. Jesus' ministry has not and will not end. He will yet work among us. He has withdrawn for a time at various times, as he did here, but he will return with power and he will be gracious to us. Do not lose heart. Be like Joseph and honor him. Prepare for him to arise among us. Prepare the way for his resurrection. Looking, uh, He will return to us after two days, and then on the third day, he will return. We don't know how long those times will be, but you're to have faith when he is buried, not seen working powerfully among us, and faith when you do not see his hand visible among us, honor him with faith that is expressed in what you do to his body. Hear and obey his call to worship that goes forth. That's what we have. Sing praises with him, rejoicing that he lives among us. Receive his word with living faith, hearing him who calls you. Lift up your prayers fervently in his name whoever lives to make intercession for us. Come to his table. Look for nourishment and strength. For on that table is the body of him who is crucified, but who is now alive, ever ready to work among us. And bless his people who are his body. Do what you can to continue to serve Christ. When things are dark, don't ever lose heart. Turn to him and serve him with the eyes of faith. He will come among us with power. He will have mercy. Do you know the people who are like Joseph that I admire so much, Joseph of Arimathea that I admire so much in the Old Testament that I often think about? Those people that were in Egypt for the years when they were in bondage, And all they had was a promise that God's going to bring you out. He's going to bless you. And you take Joseph's bones when you go to the land. And then he's going to establish you as people. They lived and died there 
without any prospect that they were going to be delivered in their lifetime. And in fact, God had told them that they would be there for a long, long time. And those people that had faith at that time, there weren't very many, but there were always those who had faith in those days that our God will come for us. Our God will visit us. Even if it becomes in our land illegal to be a Christian, I could easily see those days coming. Illegal to worship. We must continue to honor Jesus. Whether we're in prison, whether we're threatened with execution, we continue to honor our Lord because He lives. We honor Him bodily and not just in the secret recesses of our heart. If sickness overtakes you, if friends fail you, if Christian leaders fail you, if oppression and persecution comes like a tsunami, continue to honor the body of Christ even when it seems lifeless. You will see Him rise on the third day. Please stand. Oh Lord, we praise You for the model that we have of what happened when you were in the grave. Your 12 disciples, the devoted women that had stood by you and even came and stood at a distance at the cross, they were not where they should be. We see your church, Lord, so often in times of trouble, not where we should be. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would give us faith in those times. We see how you raised up this man, Joseph, this man who himself had been afraid, who had so much to lose, all that he had in this world that he had built up. He had a lot. It's much harder for people who have a lot to lose it than for people that don't have very much. Jesus told us that. It's very true. And Father, what remarkable faith that he should come forth at such a time as when Jesus was a lifeless corpse among them. Father, we pray that we would remember the promise that's addressed to the dust. We remember in Psalm 102 how it tells about your people cherishing the dust. We know that Daniel cherished the dust at Jerusalem when he prayed three times a day, turned toward Jerusalem when Jerusalem was dust and ashes. When no one was reigning there, no king was there for Israel, but they were all under Babylon, serving Babylon, doing the will of Babylon, being persecuted when they didn't do things that they could not do as your people. Father, how we praise you for those like Daniel, those like Joseph, those who are men of the hour. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would be pleased to raise up such among us. Father, that you would make us strong, that you would make us faithful, that you would make us true and diligent. And Father, that we would know your will, that we would go forth in your name, honoring you and bringing glory to you in this world, that we would do this for our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives, who is alive now, who is not dead, but who lives forever and ever. And we know that at the last day, that he will come in his glory. Just as the third day he came from the dead, so at the last day he will come in his glory and he will bring all things to completion. We thank you for all the times that he has appeared to us in a powerful way in history as well. There are times when things are very, very dark and then when he breaks forth again, again and again and again, in times in our own personal life when we are struggling and when Times are hard and, and your presence seems so far away and then you return to us again. May we always know that you will return, that you will come to us. Oh, Father, please bless us and strengthen our faith that you might be glorified by our lives. Forgive us, Lord, for all the times when we have betrayed you, when we have not honored you. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Let's prepare to come and be strengthened at the Lord's table. We need all the strength that we can get.
Lord's Supper is closely related to what we looked at, of course, today about Jesus' body in Mark 15. At the supper, Jesus set apart bread and wine to represent his body and his blood that was his body that was given for us and his blood that was shed for us on the cross. He tells us very plainly that his blessing comes to us through his flesh, through his sacrifice. The reason that he took a body was so that he might give himself as a sacrifice in human flesh to atone for our sins. As I showed you as well, he had to live the way people were created to live in the first place, in a body in which, which is the way in which human beings serve others and in which we are called to worship God. Those are things that are properly to be done by us with our bodies, serving and worshiping. We don't just think warm thoughts but we worship and we serve bodily. As at the Lord's Supper, we are told to look to Jesus who came in human flesh and blood and who was sacrificed for us. We are to receive his body and blood as that which gives us eternal life. Not by the mere ingesting of that, but that of the bread and wine, but by eating and drinking with faith in him. His body at the table is a body that was crucified, but also a body that was raised again so that we come to him not as a dead savior, but as a living savior, a savior that was dead, but a savior that now lives, a savior who is able to give us life by his living body. This is the representation of his living body. It's not actually his flesh and blood like transubstantiation would teach. His living body is living. It's in the, in the tabernacle. It's made without hands above. And it's that body that we connect with when sacramentally we eat the bread and the wine in faith. And that living body that was crucified for us, nourishes us. This is the trysting place, if you will, the place where we bodily connect as we come in faith, looking to God to bless us. What assurance and peace it ought to give us to remember what he did and to look to him for the blessing that he promises. Here are the words of institution, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. Paul says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body." You see that there are very strong warnings about coming to the table if you are not looking to Jesus for the blessing. This is because what we saw, the risen living Lord Jesus who was crucified is present when we come to this table, to this sacrament. The bread and wine do not change into actual body and blood because his body is risen and he is alive. But that is just it. We connect with him in this ordinance as a living Savior who acts, who works, who does things among us as he did when he was here in the flesh. 
we encounter the one who is alive and that has consequences. That's why there's warnings. If you come in the wrong manner, not looking to him in faith, not looking to be fed by him, it brings cursing. If you come looking to him to feed you, you do get spiritually fed and nourished and strengthened. He lives. So we come to him as a living, risen Savior who is crucified as shown by the bread and the wine on the table. You should, you should not come unless you are a communicant member of his church, unless you are a believer who is actively looking to him. My prayer is that he will meet you here. That is what he promises to do, and that we will be fed by him who is crucified and risen again, raised again for us. Let's ask him to bless us. Oh Lord Jesus, you have given us this sacrament to make the fact that you are alive, that you truly were crucified, and that you are alive to minister to us now as the risen, crucified Lord, the risen Lord who was crucified. If you hadn't been crucified, you wouldn't be able to minister to us. But because you were crucified, then you're able to bring life to us, to bring forgiveness to us, for you have made atonement for our sins. So Lord, we come to you now and we plead with you to come here, to come near, to meet us here, to make it evident that you have met with us, to work in our lives. Lord, we are in a time when sometimes you are far away from us. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would come near, that you would draw near to your people, that you would work in us the way you worked in Joseph or the way you worked in some of the people in the Old Testament who trusted you when there was no real evidence of your hand around them. They saw much evidence of your hand, but not in the big ways. They were slaves in Egypt or, or slaves in Babylon. Father, we pray that you would give us faith like Daniel had. We're, we're here, Lord, presenting ourselves before you as needy sinners asking you, Lord, to visit us here at this table now, to visit us, Lord, and, and strengthen us that we might go forth in your name. Father, that we might use our bodies in this world to worship you and to bless our brothers and sisters in the world in the ways that you have appointed for us to bless them, in the ways that you have appointed for us to worship you. Father, our idolatry, and our immorality is what so often characterizes us as human beings. It is a perversion, it is distortion of what you made us to be and to use our bodies for. Our bodies were not made for idols to worship them. Our bodies were not made for sexual immorality or for gluttony or for drunkenness. Our bodies were made to bring glory and honor to you, our Lord and God to live beautifully, visibly beautifully. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would grant that to us. We are before you, Lord, crying out to you for your mercy. Look upon us, Lord, and have pity upon us, for we are weak. We confess that we are weak. We like the women. We like the disciples. We like the mob. We like the Pharisees. Father, have mercy wherever we may be. We're, our eyes are upon you, O Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the blessing of the Lord our God. Now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.